So I'm German and German start in time. Um, my name is Thomas Hören. I'm proud and honored to go with you through the wild world of European um, data inform um, in digital economy law. This is a huge experiment. Um, I, um, I hope uh, you would like it because it's the first time in Europe to have a lecture of a law professor in English, to have a Zoom um, tool applied, and uh, we used YouTube as well. Uh, YouTube, the data will be sent um, the, in the afternoon. Um, I hope you are all fine and we can start. Uh, in theater theory, there's a saying that the premier um, performance is always the worst. And uh, so, you know, perhaps this uh, performance might be the worst, but it's, um, we are all very enthusiastic that we have so many people listening. And um, the crowd of people are listening consists mainly of Germans, of course, um, for especially Germans practitioners. Um, then Uzbekistan people, then uh, Georgian people, then uh, Lisbon students, and uh, some uh, students from English universities. Um, before I start, I'm very happy and honored to present you our guest speaker at the beginning. Um, to introduce to you Nicolas Forgo, who is already present. Um, that is impossible because Nicolas has so many hats on his uh, head. Um, he is the head of a, a very important and famous research institute in Vienna with a, a huge crowd of people working in various EU projects and uh, national projects. So it's a big crowd of people similar for perhaps uh, to ITM in Münster. He is also a member of certain research groups uh, involving the Austrian government and the European Commission, and, 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 and. Um, and to mention at last, he is, has a video blog called Ask Boni, which I like very much, um, not, not only because of the topics, but because of his introdu introduction to interview partners. As a typical Austrian, very great idea to have a charming atmosphere in introducing um, guests in his cellar or at the video part. Um, I, I'm not so charming. I'm more harsh like Germans are, but he is one of the most charming people in introducing people, friends, and that's one of the reasons why I'm regard and I'm honored to say that Nicholas is a very close friend of mine since 30 years, more than 30 years, and it's a great, great honor. Nicholas, I'm so proud and I think you can start in giving your presentation. Thank you very much, Thomas. What you actually didn't say now, probably because you 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 are too polite not to say it, uh, is that uh, Thomas Hörn was a, a key key decision factor for my own career. Uh, many many years ago, uh, some of you were not even born yet then. I think, or most of you probably were not even born yet then. It was somewhere in the, in the mid nineties. Uh, Thomas Hörn gave a lecture in front of I think eight hundred or so attorneys in in uh, Tübingen then about the internet and the law, I think was the title or the medium is the message was the title and the subtitle was something like the internet and the law. 
And that was, for me, um, outstandingly important then, not only because it was one of the most brilliant presentations I ever attended to, and I've seen quite a lot since then, but also because it made it quite clear then to me that I'm not the only one thinking that one can build up a career uh, in law uh, when dealing with those strange things coming with the internet. Um, and since then, I have been admiring uh, Thomas, and I'm very happy uh, that I have the possibility here now to speak to you. Um, and I must also apologize that most likely, as usual, uh, most uh, most law professors probably do something like this. Most likely, like usual, um, I will not start without um, quite some disclaimers that I need to start with. Um, and uh, the first disclaimer is this one here. What I'm supposed to do here is, of course, uh, unfortunately still, uh, or fortunately as you take it, uh, very uh, law-driven, um, although I must say that it's uh, law-driven from, from a fundamental point of view. So it's not, uh, it's not the typical doctrinal um, presentation that you're going to expect now. However, uh, my perspective obviously is rather limited due to the very fact that I'm a lawyer by training. I have been working together with uh, many um, uh, computer scientists during my whole career. However, I know that my perspective is rather limited. I do hope that you see my slides, by the way. Could ki someone kindly confirm that you see my slides now? Yeah, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Okay, wonderful. So then I have a second disclaimer to make. Uh, the second disclaimer to make is I will not speak about the topic. Um, this will not be my topic. Uh, and I'm an elderly law professor. So what elderly law professors like to speak most about is uh, themselves and their uh, personal life. So the topic of this is going to be me and my career and, and what I learned out of my career. And then there's a third disclaimer to make. Uh, the third disclaimer to make is actually if you are uh, disappointed now because you would have expected um, an, um, an, a presentation given by, uh, by me uh, on, on the topic that was announced to you, um, I can tell you that uh, not necessarily I'm the best speaker to do this. Um, I did what I did in, uh, as many people do, I know, uh, what, what I did in preparation of this. I also used some of the uh, large language models, including perplexity. By the way, if you don't know perplexity yet, may I kindly and strongly recommend to you to play around with this. Because in my view, at least, this is a very interesting disruptor to um, search engines like Google. So what I did then was that I had a very small and short conversation with perplexity uh, on uh, on the topic. Um, and I must confess that I'm not that sure that what you're going to hear now from me uh, is much better um, than, uh, apart from the problem that it's about my life instead of the topic, uh, that it's much better than um, than what you might expect from from an AI uh, model such as this one here. So, uh, in in short, um, I think uh, the the problem of presentations like this is going to be in the very very near future. Not only that, people will not know whether it's an AI system or an AI model talking to them but also people not knowing whether the content that is human uh, driven is really better than what they uh, might receive from um, such a machine. And, and that would have, of course, obviously, most of, obviously, quite some impact also on university education. And if you haven't spotted this yet, uh, Thomas Hearn is inter alia, also very active on legal matters of AI, uh, AI-based teaching at universities. So he's one of the experts certainly knowing a lot about this. I, I would very much appreciate if we could also have a debate on this either here in class or outside class, then whether you think that it's still useful to listen to a human in such, um, an, in such an event. Somebody is drawing now on the, um, on the screen and that's not me, but <laughs> I, I hope that uh, it's just um, ju ju that, that this is um, somebody doing on purpose. Okay, so my life is the topic uh, and it's not perplexity. Um, 
perplexity driven. Um, I still the drawing is not from me. So whoever did this, perhaps you could redo it. If not, then just ignore. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's about my life. Um, my life. Um, let me start with a confession. The confession is I do run a department. It's called uh, Department of Innovation and Digitalization. It's located, as Thomas said, at the University of Vienna. It's I'm very proud of this. However, this is not uh, the department I always dreamt of that I should run. Uh, and there is another person who ran a department that I would have liked to run. Uh, the person uh, um, is this guy here. Um, his no name is Roy Amara. And Roy Amara founded in 1968. This is my year of birth. This is going to be important in the rest of this lecture. So in 1968, Amara uh, founded my dream department. Um, more than 55 years ago, it was already founded. Then this was the Institute for the Future um, that he founded quite a little topic the future um and what he has been what he did there was that he obviously did research about how the how the future could look like and he did this in a very interesting period of time 1968 that's the period where i will come back to this computers um appeared somewhere on the radar screens also of politicians and 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 politicians started to be interested in what those new machines might bring. So in 1968, Roy Amara wrote a statement that since then um, has um, had a quite important impact also on my personal research, because what he said then is something that is called Amara's Law. You can Google this, and there's even a Wikipedia entry on this. And Amara's Law says that we, we meaning societies, humans, people, tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and we tend to underestimate the effect of a technology in the long run so people tend to believe that something changes their life within the next week or month or year and they tend not to believe that the impact that they might not see in the first week or in the first month um, is is going to have um, quite some importance in their future life or in society's future life. This is, in my view, a very interesting and relevant law, um, such as Moore, quite similar to Moore's law, for example. It's an interesting law, uh, and it, of course, triggers a question, which is what is long and what is short uh, in this uh, statement. So what is a long-term effect and what is a short-term effect and how should we scale short and long-term effects? And this brings me back to the title or the proposal, what I would like to talk about here, which is my life. So let's take my life so far that started in 1968 as the scale uh, that we use here now to measure short-term and long-term effects on society's um, shape, but also on my personal existence. So when I was born in 1968, when Amara uh, wrote this law, computers looked like this. This is a very iconic picture. I would really, um, Tom, one of the many things uh, Thomas Hearn is really, really talented in is photography. So uh, you should discuss this with him um, inside or outside class uh, closer because he is certainly much more qualified than I am to speak about this. However, I really like this picture. And as a lay person, I think there are several points here that are interesting to be mentioned. Um, the first one is this little thing here in the lower left corner. That's a phone, how it looked like then. Um, there are several people in the room. The only woman here is the one not really watching uh, what's going on. Uh, then there is this little um, face here on sitting on the shoulder of the guy who looks a little bit melancholically into the future, sneaking a little bit around what's going on in the room. And then there is only one guy uh, really working. That's the man um, almost in the center. And he's working on, um, a, 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 I assume, with a punching card or some a punch card or something similar on a huge machine. And this is how computer looked like in 1968 uh, when I was born, as I said. Um, and there are several things important in this picture. One of the things that I want to highlight here is everyone who was in that room 
on, on that given day had um, personal memories and personal experiences from the time between 1933 and 1945. Everyone in that room know from personal experience what the Nazi regime uh, and similar terror regimes might look like. And everyone in this room, therefore, from the very beginning, in particular in Europe and within Europe, even more in particular in Germany, was on the one hand fascinated by the huge possibilities coming with these machines. So since mid-60s, people, including lawyers, start writing about all the utopian worlds these uh, machines might bring them into. And on the other hand, the dystopian, the terror part of this uh, is also always present. With the moment those machines appear in ministries, with the moment these machines appear in large companies and only those could afford them, um, those machines, both aspects of the development on the one hand, uh, uh, infinite opportunities, on the other hand, infinite threats are present. And it's no wonder, therefore, that quite at the same time, debates about in how far those threats need to be mitigated, how these risks need to be put under control, have also appeared on the, within the legal debate. So uh, the first data protection law worldwide, you probably know this, is from 1970. It's from Hessen in Germany. So right in the moment when computers still looked like this. And since then, so since more than 55 years, since my whole lifetime, lawyers have been thinking about how the incredible opportunity is coming with these machines, but at the same time also the very relevant risks coming with those machines that had been uh, perceived by those people in their personal lifetime are intensely and heavily discussed. And the hypothesis of this presentation now for me is that this is one of at least five moments in my lifetime that are in a way life-changing in the sense of Amara's law. So in the sense of that something is different after this invention and people always tend to underestimate the long-term effect, but at the same time overestimate the short-term effect, which then triggers in some cases, even a wave of legal regu regulations, of, of lawyering, of laws that tend to miss the target. So that's the first moment, the invention of computers in public bureaucracy. And then there are at least four more of those waves, and all of them are somehow connected also with my personal lifetime. So you see, in a way, by watching me, the development of those technologies or the impact of those technologies on a human uh, literally face to face. So the first thing you see it in on in the in the left uh, in in the most left part of this presentation is somewhere from 1983 or 1985. So when I'm in my early teenage years, and this is the appearance of in this case it's a Commodore 64, could have also been um, an Apple Macintosh. So the moment when um, computers become affordable, the moment when people like me, average middle class teenagers in uh, in in somewhere in, in in Europe, were able to buy such a machine, opening them literally a completely new world. So th what happened then, um, also in my personal life, was when I had this machine at home. It was connected with. The TV set at home, uh, it was very expensive. It was ridiculously uh, small when it comes to um, memory, um, um, CPU speed, etc. However, it was unbelievably potent when it came to its ability to allow people like me to develop whatever they wanted to. And it's, it's again, an irony uh, of history, perhaps, that quite in those days, so in 1983, as you know, the German Constitutional Court then came up with the next iteration of how to shape data protection, which was the idea then that there is such a phenomenon like a fundamental right to informational self-determination. 
and that this in uh, this fundamental right to informational self-determination, as it could not be found literally in the German constitution, in the German Grundgesetz, needed to be based on Article 1 and Article 2, Section 1 of the German constitution, human dignity, general personality rights. So probably on the in the most important, the most prominent, the most significant, the most basic legal layer one could find. So in the moment, those machines tend to become a common good available for everyone. At the same time, the legal system responds by or reacts by developing something like a fundamental right to, to information and self-determination. Importantly, again, in Europe, importantly, again, very much German-driven, importantly, um, um, a phenomenon that has not really made its career through other legislations outside Europe since then, importantly, a phenomenon that is not understood even in its very core basic assumptions, not understood in particular by Asian societies, but also by Northern American societies. So then in 1995, another life-changing event, some, in some cases in 1992 and 1993, some cases even later, 1998, whatever, somewhere in the mid-90s, these little gadgets that you see are now uh, in the second column here appear on the consumer market. That's a ridiculously slow 56K modem that you could connect with your phone or your phone line and that brought you on the internet. That was the moment um, where suddenly concepts of sovereignty of national states became for the um, for the first time intensely challenged. Um, texts like the uh, Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace by John Perry Barlow were written in this period. If you don't know this text yet, kindly read it. It's a very important text indicating quite clearly this libertarian or utopian everything goes, we are no longer bound by national sovereignty and national member states. Ideas were formulated um, very, very well. So in this moment, somewhere in 1995, the European legislator then, again, very much driven by um, German influence, started to heavily, heavily intend to regulate not only data protection, but still also very prominently data protection, the Data Protection Directive, which is the predecessor of the GDPR, was uh, coming into force in 1995. But it was not only data protection, there were also phenomenons like e-commerce, electronic signatures, copyright, um, distance selling, uh, electronic communications, etc., that were then intensely regulated by lawyers, again trying to mitigate risks coming uh, with these phenomena. Then again, in 2007, um, uh, uh, Steve Jobs once again uh, um, presents a life-changing invention. Um, uh, the, the declaration is called the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. Thank you for the question in in the chat, and it's from a guy called John John Perry Barlow. And John Perry Barlow is important not only for this declaration, but also for the fact that he's one of the founding members of the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, which is one of the very few and probably one of the most important NGOs dealing with um, fundamental rights on the internet for more than 30 years now from a US based approach or perspective. So John Perry Barlow is the name. So 2007, uh, Steve Jobs inventing once again a life-changing um, gadget, not just the Apple Macintosh in 1993, uh, 1983, sorry, but then again in 2007, the iPhone. What happened then uh, with the iPhone, um, people uh, understood that no longer there is a distinction to be drawn between their offline existence that is not really um, affected by uh, by by the internet or by machines or by the digital, 
and an online existence that is a little bit different. Since then, all of us have become more and more used. Um, Thomas is perhaps also uh, an exception. He is still refusing to use a smartphone as far as I know. But with the exception of Thomas, all of us are more and more used to the fact that everything that we are doing is part of our online existence so that there is no hiding behind an offline perspective any any longer. Everything is online all the time, everywhere. And what then at the same time also happens, of course, is that, um, and, and Apple is a very good example for this, perhaps even the most prominent example, uh, one of the reasons why Apple is so successful here, economically speaking, is, is that they don't just sell hardware, but that they also offer a platform, a platform that is available for, in principle, everyone, but that is a market that is in core controlled by Apple and by its terms and conditions, controlling not only um, the, the, the consumers on the market, but also controlling the vendors on the market, the providers on the market, and um, allowing them to be in an unthinkably powerful um, position um, since then. So platforms appear. And what is then happening on a legislative, um, in a legislative perspective is that uh, Europe uh, um, identifies that it is somehow behind in the world development and uh, phenomenons like the digital agenda for Europe appear trying uh, to uh, foster European innovation in the field by legal instruments. And one of the perhaps most important examples of uh, the offspring of this is GDPR, is the General Data Protection Regulation, which is importantly, clearly not as young as many of you might believe. Many of you might still have the perspective that this is a relatively new law, which is not true because it was presented by the European Commission already in January 2012, so more than 12 years ago. It took then the European legislator to more than four years to negotiate this through, and it took the European legislator or European societies two more years to put this then into force. And the debates on this, so the first green books, white books, commission draft papers, et cetera, were written quite soon after Steve Jobs had presented uh, the iPhone, so somewhere in the late 2000s already. And many of the concepts of GDPR, even one could say most of the concepts of GDPR, rely on concepts that were already known by the um, um, uh, Data Protection Directive from 1995. So it's clearly not a young law that we are dealing with. And then the last moment, uh, probably one that all of you can remember from your own personal experience is the sudden uh, appearance of um, um, a first consumer, really consumer friendly, uh, general purpose, uh, large language model, ChatGPT in 2022. And again, uh, we tend to overestimate uh, the short-term effects, trying now to regulate this very intensely. And at the same time, we underestimate the long-term effects. Let me just, um, um, let me just uh, rephrase this. Therefore, we have, uh, after my uh, birth, 1968, first changing moment somewhere with the information and self-determination, second changing uh, moment with the internet bubbles directives, third then with everything coming with the digital agenda, and fourth moment now in particular with uh, everything trying to regulate artificial intelligence. Of course, most prominently to be mentioned here is the Artificial Intelligence Act. And let me just um, invest some more minutes in the debate of the last one, so the Artificial Intelligence Act. Just some more figures. Uh, when ChatGPT was presented, it took ChatGPT or its company running ChatGPT not more than just five days until the first million of users uh, were actively using this. Five days and one million of users. And since then, we have, of course, seen a very, very uh, impressive explosion 
of user rates somewhere in April 2023, 1.8 billion visits, 1.8 billion visits per month with a growth rate in some month of 130%. So I would really call this an explosion of use. Again, most, most importantly, um, an explosion of use of a product, of a service that is in its very core not European, and that is in its very core, therefore, not following uh, fundamental European values, and not following fundamental European understandings of how technology could or should be regulated. Um, interestingly, what you see here also is that somewhere in June 2023, so more than a year ago, some kind of decrease of uh, of visits started, which has become even more significant since then. So if these figures are correct, um, we we ended up now in June 2024. Those are the most uh, most recent uh, figures that I found uh, in June 2024 with a number of just 260 million uh, visits per month, which is almost just a tenth of what it was at the the peak moment. Um, so it's an irony, in my view, that right in the moment when G when the AI Act finally is published um, in the official journal, and when the AI Act finally is uh, in force, uh, the the phenomenon that very very intensely triggered the debate and the speed that was needed in order to get this through before the parliamentary legislation uh, the parliamentary elections in spring of this year that the phenomenon triggering this was already declining so again just like in most of the other phenomena that i was just mentioning the legislator is a few months in some cases a few years late when trying to regulate this phenomenon in this case now via the uh, artificial intelligence act um that follows in some of its approaches, some of the lessons that we learned that we, meaning the European legislator learned in particular by GDPR. One of the lessons is, I think this is possibly even the most important lesson for the commission is people take you serious if the fines that you uh, threat them with are high enough. Just like in GDPR, uh, the the fines that you risk if you offend uh, the AI Act are significant. In this case, even more significant than in uh, in the GDPR. It's up to seven percent of the worldwide annual turnover. If you take a company like uh, like OpenAI or Google or Meta, all of them, of course, being involved quite intensely at the moment in the development of large language models and other AI solutions. These are significant numbers. This might lead to the effect that just like with GPR, the C-level uh, management deals with this and, and tries to understand what's going on here in Europe. And I do believe that this is already happening. What is also happening is that, again, just like in GPR, the European legislator somehow overestimates um, its own importance. Let me just show you this with um, a screenshot from um, Thierry Breton's uh, Twitter account. Twitter, uh, Thierry Breton, as you might remember, was since uh, until just a few weeks ago, the French representative in the European Commission. He was in charge um, of uh, the um, uh, the economy within the European uh, Commission, and he was therefore also, in parts at least, in charge for the digital economy as aspects, including the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, and uh, and the AI Act. And when uh, the AI Act had finally made it through the political negotiations. What you see on the left side is what he twittered. It's an irony that he used Twitter because he has been in quite intense uh, debates with uh, Elon Musk about what Twitter is or is not supposed to do. What he did there was he tweeted, however, um, this little graph on the left side. And what users then did uh, is that they responded on this by putting um, uh, Breton's uh, tweet into some context. 
First, uh, the EU last time they checked was not a continent. Uh, second, uh, the EU last time they checked was obviously not the first um, uh, having an um, NAI regulation. Might be true that we are the first having such an extensive piece of text, but by far we are not the first dealing with this. Things became even more unpleasant than uh, in the following uh, hours after this tweet. People started to comment uh, and uh, quite nastily and to produce quite um, some, in some cases at least, funny, uh, funny um, um, answers to that. So what is this about? Uh, what is the AI Act about? And I think the, the just like in 1968 or just like in 1983 or just like in 1995, just like in 2007, this is in particular and primarily something trying to mitigate risk. When you look into the official documentation, on the left side, you see that of the commission. On the right side, you see that of the parliament. Don't ask me why the colors are different. I would assume that they are different because the default settings of the computer used to draw this for the first time were, di were set differently. So what you see is um, um, from the very beginning as a key political argument that Europe needs to, that again, just like in 1968, computers slash AI brings unbelievable opportunities, unbelievable chances. On the other hand, it also brings unbelievable risks and we need to mitigate these risks by this instrument, first by, um, by putting these risks into different risk categories. This is a very good news for all of us being lawyers because it will keep us very busy, just like GDPR kept us very busy and still keeps us very busy. It will keep us very busy to discuss quite in some detail uh, whether something is to be put into this or that risk category. Somebody is responding now on this somewhere in the chat. Let me just read this. Um, um, So um, th this means there are no regulations for AI in other countries. As I said, uh, Thierry Breton, in my view at least, was wrongly making this statement and he was rightly corrected that uh, that Europe was by far not the first country. Uh, there is plenty of, uh, of legislation specifically dealing with AI that is older than the AI Act, um, in particular in China, uh, but also in, in some of the US states and in some other areas of the world, and more importantly, even perhaps everywhere in the world, everything that was so far developed to regulate uh, digital or uh, or computer-driven phenomena is also to be applied to AI. So this is obviously a, a wrong statement that uh, Breton gave here. Uh, and I think he was very much aware of the fact that it was a wrong statement. It was just a rhetorical um, a rhetorical statement for political reasons. Um, and that there are risks coming with this, uh, absolutely, this is the core of my <laughs> argument here, absolutely, there are risks coming. The question then is how to mitigate those risks, how to limit those risks, and whether the AI Act is the right instrument to do that. That That is the question that I'm trying to answer now, a little bit more uh, skeptically, perhaps. Um, so it's about risk. First question then is, and risk control. First question, obviously, is what is risk? Um, and interestingly, uh, the AI Act now provide in in his in its unbelievable um, tendency to try to clarify everything by writing everything into the law. Also, now gives us a very clear um, a very clear definition on what uh, risk is going to be on, um, seen at. And the risk, according to Article 3, Section 2 of the AI Act, is the combination of the probability of an occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. So it's a kind um, of, um, of um, equation here that needs to be taken. On the one hand, we have how probable is it that something is going to happen. On the other hand, on the other side, we have how severe is this going to be. And the more severe it is, the less likely it might be and vice versa, right? So it's a kind of um, 
um, a system, a moving system, if you want. Uh, German, Austrian uh, lawyers would probably call this a bewegliches system, which is a funny concept in Austrian private law. Uh, actually, not really a concept in my view, but just a rather simple idea. But anyhow, um, so such a system, such a moving system, having two factors that might be the variables. One point, one provocative point that I would like to make here, in my in my view, this is uh, this is a very unethical description of risk, um, and it's it's by far not an obvious description of risk. Why is it unethical? Because if something is a very severe risk, um, and this risk occurs to you, then it is still a very severe risk, and it doesn't help at all that others are not affected by that risk. So it uh, there is some marginalization of marginalized groups groups and uh, and people in this um in this uh, equation that is in my view uh, fundamentally ethically to be challenged unfortunately there was not enough time uh also in discussing such very basic questions when the ai act came into life uh, for reasons that i tried to mention already this 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 definition came came relatively light in uh, relatively late um, into the act, and as far as I know, it was never ever fundamentally questioned and doubted whether this is the right approach. It's a system that we know already in Taylia from data protection law and data security law, where this equation between probability and severity is rather well known. But in this case here, we don't talk about security risks from computers or machines. We talk about risks that might uh, realize in lives of humans with quite some significant effect. Despite of the fact that already uh, the definition per se, therefore, is in my view rather questionable, we still find some kind of risk obsession in this extensive text you find in the 462 pages that the printout needed on my machine, 624 hits of the term risk in the text. So there's 1.4 hits uh, of uh, of um, risk per page. So I have never seen a less risk obsessed, uh, sorry, a more the risk obsessed uh, legal text at all in my legal career. It's a risk obsession uh, that appears here in particular becoming even more obvious by the fact that uh, obviously the AI Act is not the only attempt to try to regulate risks and to mitigate risks in Europe, but that it's coming together with a lot of other legal acts, many of them being relatively young as well, and in particular with the uh, with GDPR being some kind of a sun in the solar system, because everything that is around GDPR in this graph has to take GDPR into consideration into the, in, in the sense that GDPR is to be remain unaffected. So all of those have all of those other acts or directives have somewhere a rather mysterious clause stating GDPR remains fully apl applicable. All of those therefore triggering very, very uh, nasty questions of uh, systematic interpretation, how this relationship really looks like. So it's a solar system. GDPR is somewhere in the center, in the core. Uh, all the others are the planets around. All of them, and in particular, the AI are trying to mitigate the risk coming with AI. So the question then is, what is AI and what is an AI system according to the AI Act? Unfortunately, I have only a very limited and very uh, complicated definition of an AI system. Everything that is read in this definition that is a, a literal excerpt from Article 3, Section 1 of the AI Act is here in red because it's a PhD topic in my view. So if you are looking for a PhD topic, there are at least four in this, uh, in this, on, in this very short definition. All of those are, of course, unclear all of those are not understandable and not shared by computer scientists if you talk to any computer scientist about this definition i tell you all of them will let you know and i've done this experiment now i don't know 150 times 
all of them will let you know that this is a definition they cannot really work with. So we have a non-workable definition uh, with at least four PhD topics in it now about what this whole act is trying to regulate. This is, of course, rather frustrating, in particular, if you hear this in the keynote. So let me therefore provide you, instead of this, with a positive and a negative definition about what this is about the AI Act, my positive definition would be something that is doing something. If it's not rule-based, it's most likely going to be um, an AI system according to the uh, to the regulation. And the negative definition is if it's uh, written in PowerPoint, it's AI. If it's written in anything else, it's most likely Python. If it's written in Python or anything else, it's most likely machine learning. So the, the, the serious point that I'm trying to make here is this is a classical example of a political compromise written by lawyers, not really uh, working with the technology they try to regulate on a daily basis and the outcome in this case, very much influenced by the OECD, is a political compromise definition not really usable for a day-to-day -day, uh, distinction that is most likely needed here. And the day-to-day -day distinction that, importantly, again, is coming with a billion euro risk, literally, if you miss uh, the, the terms here, at least if you miss them in a sense that the European Court of Justice finally tells you that you missed the terms. When is this going to be applied? In short, uh, it's rather urgent. It came into force in August 2024. And now we have several moments where several parts of this become applicable. So it will have a very intense, as I said, short-term effect on at least German or European players on the market. Whether it will have a similar uh, effect on non-European players is to be questioned because just like in GPR, non-European players um, have the resources and have the competences and have the legal departments certainly allowing them to challenge whatever they want to challenge here if this um, is positive for um, uh, for 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 uh, for their business model. Um, Article 3.1 makes a little bit more sense if you consult Recital 12 to the AI Act might be, but... Uh, for, for reasons of time, I will not go into detail here, but trust me, again, I insist for PhD thesis is at last that I'm willing to supervise uh, from this definition. What is coming with this, just like with the other examples that I was mentioning before, is of course a lot of governance and a lot of governance bodies. Uh, these are just the five more most important ones coming with this, one of them being the National Competent Authority, and just like uh, in other examples that I could have stressed if I had more time on this, uh, it's funny to see now again how every single member states in Europe, every single member state in Europe now tries to find its uh, national competent authority. In Germany, as you certainly know better than I do, uh, it's now again the Bundesnetzagentur coming into this. In other countries, such as in Austria, most likely, it will be more closely related uh, with the federal chancellery. We already have an AI advisory board. I'm happy to be and proud to be a member of that board uh, that is very closely related with the federal chancellery and not with the uh, uh, telecom um, regulator and not with the data protection authority. The European Data Protection Authority, such as the European Data um, Protection Supervisor, have found this to be an interesting new area of activity. Such, uh, you see this from this screenshot from the European Data Protection Supervisor. Suddenly, there appeared on the very top level of their website a whole new chapter on artificial intelligence. And I'm quite sure that this is not the only new website or the only website having such a new chapter. There's plenty of text, plenty of pages written at the moment, not only, but also by the European Data Protection Supervisor about in how far uh, AI is to be and AI models and systems are to be applied in, uh, in uh, relation to GDPR and other legal instruments. Um, if you want to read that, um, I did this for you, probably because I'm the only one in the room having enough uh, time resources for this. If you want to read this, um, the outcome of this, however, is a rather ex uh, frustrating experience because what you read here is first 
uh, it doesn't affect, uh, so GPR reading doesn't affect AI act reading and vice versa. And second, it doesn't really give you any uh, reliable answer that you could that you could need in your day-to-day -day practice. The answers read very much like uh, ChatGPT or perplexity written answers. This is uh, one of the examples here. The question is, can e e European institutions use generative AI? That's the question. And the European Data Protection Supervisor answers just like Ch ChatGPT or perplexity would answer. In principle, yes, provided that you follow the rules, right? So as an European institution, there is no obstacle in principle to develop, deploy, and use generative AI systems, providing that the EU European institutions' rules allow it and that all applicable legal requirements are met. I wouldn't call this a very useful answer to this very simple question. And that's my my closing remark here. So my closing remark is first, we are in a way not still not understanding uh, the law that I was mentioning at the beginning that we underestimate uh, the long-term effects of what we are doing, but we do overestimate the short-term effects, um, developing too many activities in a very short notice. And the second remark that I want to uh, end with is, if you are interested in this, um, the, the bad news is nobody, not only not me, uh, will be able to master this in a 45 minutes keynote. We will mm -hmm. certainly need a lot more of debate in the upcoming years on this. Some of this debate is also to be is already to be seen on on the YouTube channel that uh, Thomas was kindly mentioning in the introduction. I'm responsible for. Ars boni, just for those of you who don't know the term, is Latin and it stands for one of the oldest and probably most influential definitions of the law ever written. It's coming from the uh, Digest of Justinian, which is starting with the statement that the law is ars boni et equi, so the art, not the science, the art of doing the right and adequate or equitable thing. Thank you very much. If you're interested, in this, there's time. plenty of new and other content on this. And mm -hmm. I'm very much looking forward. If there are any questions, <clears throat> you still have a time for answering questions to receive your questions or responses. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, perfect introduction to our course. Um, we cannot allow questions, I think, because we are more than almost 200 listeners. But you cannot avoid my typical present, uh, which will be sent next week, a bottle of Georgian or red wine, because that's the tradition of the ITM for good speakers, and you are an excellent speaker, so you uh, should uh, at least get two bottles. Um, so I will send you two bottles of red wine. You cannot avoid it. Um, what I know, what the listeners are doing, um, it's always a question, can we get the slides? Um, Sure, of course. Yeah, if you get, get if you send me the slides, I will distribute the slides uh, to all the other people. So thank you, and I will skip now to come to my um, thirty minutes presentation. Bye bye. See you in Vietnam. Um, Mabu, Papa. So rush, 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 we have to work quite hard. I have not so beautiful slides and uh, Nicolas, um, I first want to talk to you about the structure of the program so that you understand what we are doing. So, so, so one moment. We have, in, we call LDE, we're not speaking of a law of the digital economy because it's so complicated to tell always law of the digital economy. It's LDE, and LDE consists of two blocks. <laughs> Each block um, is one semester. So in the first block for this semester, we are 
trying to understand the current status quo of European data uh, economy law, um, especially the question of EU regulation in intellectual property law. That means <coughs> confidentiality directive, software protection directive, database directive. Then a key commodity is a nice French word for all the things which uh, the European Court of Justice ever decided, summarized in one block, and that will be told to you by Guido Westkamp. He is a professor in London, so we have a guy from London talking as well. And of course, we have a block on AI and copyright law in this moment, one of the top issues, because the District Court of Hamburg has decided very astonishingly clear um, guidelines on that topic. So that's the first semester. Then in the first semester, the first block, we will still try to do um, with fair dealing law. That means um, we call it in Germany UVG, Lauterkeitsrecht. Then we are talking about e-contracting and consumer protection. Then we are talking about <coughs> data protection. I will come in November to Tiflis to give a one day about general data protection regulation. And we are talking here um, on specific question of data protection or uh, regarding AI and data. Um, in the second block, which is the block in summer term, um, we are talking about all these queer data acts uh, of the European Commission <coughs> and the European Union, such as the DMA is a Digital Market Act, that's an antitrust law, a new um, um, regulation on that. The DSA, the Digital Services Act, is, is a new regulation on um, the question of liability, especially for host providers. <laughs> then we are talking about the Digital Governance Act. Thank you. Um, there's somebody who has a microphone on. Let me tell you in between, you have to... Yeah, uh, you have to open. I would like to open you your camera so that we see you, but to stop the microphone, huh? that would be nice. So the DGA, the DGA has to do with the question of um, data organization uh, who is governing a common heritage of data funds. Then. The very important uh, DA Data Act, which says you have to give your data to the data to the person concerned. If you are storing data in a Volkswagen, for instance, Volkswagen has to open the files to everyone buying a Volkswagen. In the second block, we are also talking about cybersecurity. Where well, there's a cyber security act as well. Then we have specific uh, European acts on financial data and health data, for instance. That is DORA for financial data. That is European Data Health Protection Act um, for health data. And again, we have some other regulations which are uh, already coming into existence. And at the very end, we are making a final look on AI law and liability, as that is the AI Act, which uh, um, uh, Nicholas has mentioned. So then, between the two blocks, we have um, this is a winter block and the summer term. We finish every term with an exam. Uh, in the winter exam, um, we are using Moodle, which allows us 
to ask you multiple choice questions, that is a horror for you, because we say multiple choice, that's only for um, future doctors making the exam. But you will see Moodle is a very nice tool and a very intelligent, so you have to be aware what is asked in a Moodle uh, questionnaire. Um, in the second block, this, after the summer term, we are thinking about an open essay. You are thinking as an essay about a topic which we propose. Um, and then you get a final, final party, a big party. So with a lot of wine in Germany, in Münster, uh, we are celebrating your exam. So uh, you get uh, every stamp we have or put on a paper that you can be really proud. So, if you have questions in between, you can ask, of course, any time in the chat. You can ask me after the lecture. You can ask Philip Meyer or a good guy for organizing the background. And we have special uh, sessions here, um, which we propose where you can simply ask all your questions which you want. That's Q and A um, called question and answer sessions, so that you are not alone sitting in a dark room. Let me start first by checking international law. Which regulations are existing uh, on a pan-international way? So checking every country like Georgia, like Uzbekistan, like Portugal. What do we have in common if it comes to the question of information law? So we have, as a survey, we have cybersecurity treaties, we have e-commerce and digital trade um, governed by certain international organizations. We have internet governance rules um, proposed, for instance, by ICANN. I will tell you what ICANN is. We have data protection uh, rules uh, made, for instance, by the United Nations, the famous Convention 108. And we have several rules for international property, um, special treaties um, for defining, for instance, copyright law. Let me check it point by point. Um, first topic um, proposed by the U United Nations is the topic of cybercrime. So that's a famous um, Budapest Convention on, of, on Cybercrime is a convention on cybercrime of the Council of Europe, a crucial international treaty that is designed to address the challenges of cybercrime. It was made in the 90s of last century. Um, you see here the discussion started in 1997. Then there was a project to draft the state treaty the treaty uh, was completed in 2001, and the treaty, the convention, entered into force 2004. The convention is the first international treaty on crimes committed by uh, via the internet, especially if it comes to copyright, as one topic, but child pornography as well. And of course, the bizarre people, hackers. Um, yesterday, I've seen a film on hackers from North Korea, and there are thousands of hackers working for the state. That is a violation of network security, and we need a separate convention for that. It's a Budapest Treaty. Then we have 
the work of the United Nations in the area of data protection. That's the Convention 108, very early, um, uh, 1981, which uh, is in mostly influenced by German regulation. So we can be proud to say that's German. Apart from the United Nations, we have UNCITRAL, located in the most beautiful country, uh, state um, town which I know in Vienna, and they are responsible for e-contracting for the question, how can we build up a common framework for closing contracts via digital signature? As, uh, that has to do with digital signature. Um, so the UNCTAD model law of on e-commerce from 1996 and from 2001 provides rules on the use of electronic signatures so that electronic documents are accepted on an international level. So then we have the OECD. Um, situated in France, and they are responsible from an international perspective in this moment for solving the issue of tax law in the internet. Because of, uh, take the Chinese people, they are selling all goods and they have special tax rates which are not compatible with the European tax standards. So the OECD is trying to establish rules for that. Then we have WIPO, WIPO, the best um, restaurant in the world, uh, in an international organization, might be found at WIPO if, if you are in, in Geneva one day. You have to go to the restaurant in the WIPO, which is one of the best restaurants I've ever seen. Um, it's a very nice building, very impressive. Um, they are also responsible for the harmonization of copyright and trademark law. So, um, and they have uh, an expert team who is um, checking um, in research the conditions for circulating information. Um, they are discussing new um, treaties on copyright in the, for instance, in the internet. Apart from that, the people from Uzbekistan might know the APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, as a multinational agreement between Asian Pacific countries. Then we have for international trade in general, the WTO, as well as situated in Geneva, and they are very responsible for setting and executing rules for international trade. And what they do is, for instance, very quick, they have established a working program very early on e-commerce. Then they check the world in customs duties and make a moratorium on custom duties. They are now very much known for the discussion in two agreements, the General Agreement on Trade in Services, GATS, uh, to build up um, international uh, rules for making services on an international level. They are most known for TRIPS. TRIPS is trade-related aspect of international property rights. We will talk about TRIPS um, next time because TRIPS, for instance, has rules on trade secrets protection, on software protection, on database uh, protection and so on. 
So and then we have the famous other next organization called ICANN. ICANN was a dream. It was a dream of having a um, non-governmental international organization not controlled by states responsible for internet. The ICANN stands for the International Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Um, they believed, they believed, they are not, um, but they believed in the past, they are the internet government, government per se, they can control who is doing what on the internet. Um, if you see ICON, what is really ICON, uh, I, I will explain you, it's only a um, private company is situated in California, um, but with a lot of people working and discussing there, they are responsible for domain name system management. That's a very nice idea which they got. Um, if you want to use the internet, you need to have a number. That's a uh, do domain name, uh, IP address. So you can say, I want to use um, I one four two one two five five eight, and if you type in that number, you're getting the access to the internet server of the University of Münster. It's always very bad uh, to know a number consisting of uh, eight um, um, numbers. So please visit me on uh, one, two, four, and so on. Um, so I can have the idea to tra transform the IP system into domain names that might be www.uni-munzer.de. That's quite easy. Everybody is memorizing that. So very good. But you need to have a directory to find who is standing behind uh, www.unimünzer, you need at least to have the number. So there's one group in our society who is only using the number still, that is called the um, dark internet. Perhaps you've heard about dark internet. Dark is, internet is only a sign for people using still the old numbers to get not found, to, to sell drugs, weapons, whatever they want. So most IP addresses are transformed to domain name systems and the combination of IP addresses and domain name names um, is made by certain routers, by computers, and they are under control of ICANN. So the location of the IP address is co uh, coordinated by ICANN so that you can use a certain IP address to find a certain address. The protocols uh, of this, these servers is going to uh, use, and of course, the people who are under control of these AO servers, they have the power. And as ICANN is under control of the most important AO servers, the biggest servers, there's a certain danger always that the United States are so powerful because ICANN is a private company organized in California. So the in the U.S. government has a certain access to every server and to, and to every access being given in the internet. That's the reason why ICANN is thinking they are the master of one. They are the organization. That's is, uh, for me a very important important slide. That's I call it the OM slide. We will find nothing mentioned on it. You simply make 
Yeah, so, so even in the internet, you can make war. Oh, that was a quick rush through the world of international organizations because now I'm coming to the problem who is governing and how they govern the right of information. We are talking about um, law of the digital economy, that means data and information. And we have three different passes, three different ways to approach to the problem of the right of information. Two, three different theories. If you're going to Munich, you will find the Orthodox people. And so I'm not a fan of Munich, uh, either in football, neither uh, in other areas. These Orthodox people think um, you can give exclusive rights in the information. So we say we have a content industry and this industry should get an exclusive rights in information. Then, uh, I can use that one. So they think the basic rule is every knowledge should be protected by copyright. That is, for instance, now the approach to say, and um, if you have an AI world, we need to protect ourselves against AI. The creators need protection because they have an overall right in information. So AI is only regarded as a danger. So they try to avoid uh, giving access to data. If somebody is saying, I, I, I have a right to get access, they say, no, 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 no. This can only be given as a narrow exception. And so they are talking about exceptions. The second model, that's what Nicholas has mentioned um, 30 minutes ago. It was an idea which you find in the United States, uh, for especially by John Perry Barlow and in the Declaration of Independence of the Internet. These people, and there's a common approach at every, uh, any Euro, uh, American university, believe that the overall, the most important principle is freedom of information. That uh, has to do with the uh, American Constitution, which says information needs to be free. So, th therefore, the most important sentence in the Declaration of Independence of the Internet is information yearns to be free. That's the principle. Then, of course, intellectual property is not a general rule, but is a, an exception. And this exception has to be interpreted narrowly. It's a totally other theory than being taught in Munich. That's the two parts of the world. I'm not, I was for years, I was a fan of this American model, but I'm getting old um, and I'm thinking, why does information want to be free? Who has said that? Perhaps information wants to be free, wants to be paid. So there's no justification for that sentence. It's a, a thing which you call a religious dogma. So the first model, um, the third model is my approach. That's the Constitution approach. Simply go into the Constitution, meet my nice six uh, constitutional law colleagues uh, in the faculty, and let them decide. Uh, it's a balance issue. We have a balance problem between freedom of information and exclusive rights in information, and that balance is to be solved 
through the constitution. If you remember the constitu constitutional course in Germany, that's called Praktische Konkordanz. We have to find a solution under um, um, uh, Verhältnismäßigkeit, Proportionalness. Also every fundamental right must be developed to its full potential. That means we have to check the constitution. The constitution has a very nice, important background, has a human dignity principle. Then we have personal general uh, personal rights. We have um, a principle of freedom of information in most constitutions. Uh, it will show you in the Charter of the European Union. We have a right to informational self-determination, very important for German lawyers. And we have a principle of freedom and of protection of property. In the Charter of the European Union, in Article R8, you, for instance, find the protection of personal data, Article 7, protection of privacy, Article 16 and 17, protection of property or protection of freedom um, of information and art. And therefore, all the competences in the EU are grouping around these constitutional rights. They have to check to find the real good balance. Um, I have uh, sent you an email in advance of our course, for, uh, especially if you are, have no idea about European Commission and uh, European Union. In this video, I have asked one of my students from Vienna to explain in simple language how does the European Union work. Uh, I would really uh, um, recommend to look at video, especially if you're coming from outside the European Union. Because in this whole course, we, we will not speak, uh, unfortunately, on Uzbekistan law, because there is not so much law. Um, we are not spoke, speaking about Georgian law, because I'm afraid um, they don't have many laws on information law. We are mostly talking about law of the European Union. I will avoid, strictly avoid, to speak about Germany. That's my experiment. Can I avoid to say the big ha has said so, so and so? I will avoid that. So, om, om, om. And we are going to content. The starting point for the whole lecture series is um, information is free, is not protected. As I said, I'm not convinced that there's really a, a starting point per se, but it's a good starting point from a didactic, uh, from a teaching. Uh, information doesn't belong to anybody. It's free. If you have freedom of information, that leads to really high questions in the internet. Because in the meaning, in the understanding of the European Court of Justice, freedom of information involves, for instance, algorithm. I don't, I'm not uh, uh, telling you now for 45 minutes what an algorithm is. I had a, a student, a doctoral student, uh, 20 years ago, has, has written a um, doctoral thesis on the copyright protection for algorithm. And one day he came to me and said, Thomas, I found 150 definitions of, of algorithm. Which definition should I re use? I said, I don't know. 
Um, I can only say algorithm means the mathematical logic of a computer program. No, two plus two, that means four. And that is in the sense of European Court of Justice free and can be used by anybody. Not only in copyright law, but as well in patent law. The same applies for interfaces. That is um, another technical term. If you want to combine your printer with a computer, the computer needs to understand how can I talk to a, a printer. That's the so-called interface. And the uh, European Commission has decided that for antitrust law reasons, that interface needs to be free. Nobody should have a monopoly on this very important technical information. The European Co of, uh, Court of Justice has decided on programming languages. That was this famous SAS case, a case where somebody created a programming language and said, every person who is reading, uh, using my programming language um, is violating my copyright law, he has to pay. Um, but in a programming language is in the computer itself you find certain traces of a programming language, and therefore the European Court of Justice said it should be free. And in the same decision, he, uh, the ECJ decided software functionalities uh, that are elements which are functional from a technical point should be free to use in copyright law and patent law. Um, the last step for the freedom of information was um, the dictated by necessity test that's called look and feel. Um, imagine you see one person running around in Hamburg and he sees a, a, a computer program of a third person um, used for accounting. And this uh, program of a third person is made totally different than your problem. He said, I don't have a problem with this product. It's uh, totally dissimilar to mine. But when I open the program and I use it, it the screens on the uh, terminal are the same. In the case of the District Court of Hamburg, he said, there is um, an account called Activa, there is an account Passiva. And that's the same with my code. So if you open a computer program, the terminal shows the same structure. And the district court of Hamburg said, ah, uh, an accounting software always have a part more plus or minus. That's it's always the same. That's dictated by necessities. If you are an accountant, you need a structure of activa and passiva. So that's free, very free. Um, I only tell you that case and then I stop. I had to decide one day, I was a court of appeal judge in Düsseldorf, and four nerds are coming to me and said, we are Sheldon, no? and we uh, have made a program on railway stations no? for freaks. And we have programmed a railway station with a railway, there's smoke coming out of the roof, there's a tree standing in front of the railway station, and I've, we have found a company called Ubisoft who has used the same structure as our products. They have a railway station, they have a railway, 
there's smoke coming out of uh, the roof, there's a tree standing there. Please prohibit that product. I said, no, 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 no. That is dictated by necessities because it belongs to software on railways to have smoke, a railway station, and a tree standing in front of a railway station. So no chance to hear that. So I stop my lecture and tell you that's very nice of you to show yourself uh, in the camera. Uh, that's very helpful and very good, uh, for, especially for me and the other lecturers to see at these people. Um, are you satisfied with the first lecture? Is there any real, um, criticism or if you don't talk, you have to be silent? Um, you can send me any re a mail. I will uh, use your chat as well. So next time, uh, Mr. Ms. Karen Cunningham, do you want to do you want to answer anything? Ah, can you? Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you uh, for the first lecture. I'm very excited to be a uh, part of uh, this uh, project. Um, my question, I have a question to the content. I, I Unfortunately, I don't have a chat function on my Zoom. I don't know why. Can we ask questions in the in class or uh, uh, you, you, you can prefer via me, email? You can send me in the email. Is that okay. Easy to okay. All right. Thanks a lot. And next time, what we do is to check what does freedom of information mean uh, in copyright law. And then we are coming to the point that the form of a product might be protected. And we have a first element of protection that is trade secret. So next week, we start with trade secret. Thank you for listening. And bye bye. The YouTube will be shown this evening. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Much bye bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone.